So let's raise that first question that comes through the Prime Minister's stand on ED and on electoral bonds. The entire issue of corruption. Na khaunga, na khane dunga. Rahul Verma, former cent, uh, fellow with the Center for Policy Research with us. Salman So, spokesperson Congress. Tuhin Sinha, spokesperson BJP. Sumant Raman, to give us a perspective from the South, because he will, uh, there's much that the PM also had to say on the South. But first, let's start with the ED and the EC. Salman Sos, the Prime Minister makes it very clear that, look, only a fraction of the total cases that the ED is prosecuting are against politicians. The majority are against business. He cites that one lakh crore plus of assets have been seized. Two thousand crores in cash has been seized. Why only single out politicians, says the Prime Minister. Your response to that and to the electoral bonds, where he says it was meant to root out black money. When the Prime Minister was first contesting as a prime ministerial candidate, Rajdeep, he only talked about corrupt politicians. And now, if, we, if you believe the prime minister, that means you know, only 3% of the cases are, are against the opposition uh, or against uh, politicians, that means he's now certifying that politicians are not that corrupt. That's, that seems to be what he's saying. But be that as it may, the 3% of the cases that he talks about, 95% of those cases are against opposition leaders. And Rajdeep, a recent Indian Express uh, expose basically highlighted that 25 prominent leaders who have joined the BJP, out of them, 23, they came from different parties, including my own, 23 out of these 25 prominent cases, their cases have either been slowed down or closed. Now, if the prime minister is, and the BJP, if they claim to be truly, you know, na khaunga na khane dunga, then Rajdeep, one must ask a very simple question. Why did the Prime Minister and the then late Finance Minister Arun Jaitley bring a scheme that was designed, designed to hide the names of donors to political parties? Why hide that information from the public? And why, now that the Supreme Court has said this was unconstitutional, it is illegal, why has the Prime Minister not resigned? Because this is a slap on the face of this government. This is a corruption scandal, no bigger than this corruption scandal, at least in my lifetime. The Prime Minister the says Court it's a- forced to say this. The Prime Minister says it's a bad idea not to have electoral bonds. You will regret it. No, let me, let me, let me answer. Let me, and if the Prime Minister or his people who, are, who may be watching uh, your show, you cannot say, Mr. Prime Minister, that something that the Supreme Court has said is unconstitutional and illegal is the standard for India. There are many countries around the world where people give donations and those are made public because the public, Rajiv, you, the other panelists, I, the general public, the poorest of the poor in India have a right to know who's funding political parties so that the kind of hafta vasuli, the chanda do, dhanda do kind of uh, schemes that they ran through electoral bonds, they become, they don't become a problem for this country. We already, by the way, Rajdeep, we already have obscene, obscene levels of inequality in this country. Worse than the times of the British, and I'm not saying this, this is world-renowned economists like uh, Chancel and Piketty, they're saying this. We cannot do this to our country. We cannot do this to the poor people of this country. We cannot do this to the middle classes. So you're not accepting okay. situation. You're, you're, not accept, have... you're not accepting the prime minister's defense of electoral bonds or of enforcement directorate. Of Predictably, prime... just a minute now. Tuin Sina, you know, the prime minister is saying that electoral bonds uh, being scrapped is something the political system will regret. They were scrapped by the Supreme Court. And the Prime Minister does not answer, and the question wasn't asked, about the allegations of specific quid pro quos. That's where the opposition is claiming that the electoral bond scheme had become about extortion. The Prime Minister says that, 90, that only 3% of ED cases are against politicians, but doesn't answer, or there is no question asked to him, about the fact that 95% of that 3% is against opposition. So the Prime Minister gets away by only being economical with the truth is what the opposition is alleging here. He's not telling the country the full truth. 
Well, good evening, Rajdeep. Good evening, everybody. As far as the ED is concerned, the ED was a friendly organization under the Congress party. And, you know, data speaks for it. If, if 5,000 crore is worth of property, illegal property, was all that they could seize in the, in the period preceding 2014 compared to the 1 lakh crore worth of property which has been seized subsequently, data speaks for itself. Moreover, it doesn't need pri the Prime Minister to talk about uh, the, the, the authenticity of ED action. You just need to refer to the Delhi High Court ruling on Kejival last week when Kejival had gone pleading for bail. What did the ED say? The ED not only validated the PMLA clauses against Kejival, it specifically mentioned that there is proof, there is evidence to show, uh, to show his direct involvement, complicity in the conspiracy, and also upheld the fact that there is absolutely nothing to suggest that the ED timing was suspect. So all of those parties, not just Ahmadmi Party, but all of those parties who are saying that ED is corrupt or ED is compromised, should actually have felt embarrassed talking about the, you know, talk, talking ill about the ED post that. Now, when it comes to electoral bonds, you have to, you know, if you talk about electoral bonds, you will also have to compare it with the system preceding that. It is a fact that it is because of electoral bonds that the money trail, who gave the money and where the money went, you know, because essentially whatever... If you, if you take away, if you for a moment, if you keep the anonymity aspect aside, it is a fact that the donation and whether, you know, giving the donation or receiving donation reflects in the balance sheet of both the donor and the donee and the person receiving the donation. If anonymity is an issue, that can subsequently, you know, any system can't be perfect. It can be corrected over a period of time. But before electoral bonds, the Congress party for, you know, election money was the biggest scam for Congress party. They would donate you know, lakhs and crores of money, but the top leaders would gulp down a big chunk of it, leaving only a fraction of it for the party. The reason why the party started to plummet and, you know, come down to the level that it, it came down to in 2014 and from where it could never recover. So I think, you know, the Congress needs to recover. Besides, most importantly, most importantly, only 37% of the total donations via electoral bonds has reached us, whereas our share in the parliament is way above 50 percent. No, so where you know, you I think get that one minute? 37 percent is the wrong to, figure. Uh, your party Congress got more than 50 percent. No, no, one minute. Your party got more than 50 percent of the electoral bonds money. The fact of the matter is the Prime Minister effectively seems to be suggesting that what the Supreme Court deemed unconstitutional is now he is validating it, claiming it is against black money. I want to ask you, Rahul Verma, this electoral bond, I'm, I'm just coming back from Karnataka and over the next few days I'll play some of the ground reports. It doesn't resonate among people. Most people don't even know what electoral bonds are. Is that a failure of communication? Do you believe that this is the kind of issue that actually the opposition can pick up on and nail the Prime Minister? Rahul Gandhi says the Prime Minister is being exposed. Is he really being exposed through electoral bonds? Is the opposition clutching at the wrong straws here? Uh, Prasdeep, you are absolutely right. See, uh, I think there are multiple issues here. The first one is uh, uh, electoral bonds. Can, can they be mobilized as a political plan and just right ahead of the elections? I, I think that bus has already been missed. The second issue uh, here is that large, by and large, voters in India perceive that politicians of all hue and color are involved in these kind of things where a large sums of money mm -hmm. are taken from businesses to run their political campaigns. Mm -hmm. So I don't think uh, what the expose, as the opposition would like to call it, is anything new that we learned after the Supreme Court judgment and the release of data by uh, 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 SBI. Mm -hmm. uh, we already knew that BJP is getting a largest share of electoral bonds. And this has happened since independence, that ruling party always had advantages in terms of having resources. Of course, one can argue that perhaps uh, BJP now has a disproportionate uh, advantage. Second, to be able to sort of like turn this into a corruption issue and mobilization issue, the opposition sh was hoping uh, uh, that it could sh link BJP with certain business houses and uh, with certain uh, uh, sort of like money coming into BJP coffers. What we noticed that once the second and third set of uh, information came from SBI, uh, 
the companies that had given money to BJP had also given to Trinamool Congress or DMK. So in that sense, it blunted what opposition was hoping for. Right. You know, I, I want to ask you, Sumant Raman, because uh, the DMK, for example, also benefited from electoral bonds. The Trinamool Congress benefited in Bengal. Future Gaming, a company that was also under the scanner, gave monies to these parties. Is electoral bonds resonating where you are in Tamil Nadu? The sense, again, when I was traveling through Tamil Nadu, these are not the issues. Uh, is the enforcement directorate and this talk of a washing machine really resonating among the people? Is the opposition, as I keep insisting, perhaps latching on to the wrong issues rather than focusing on jobs and prices? Rajdeep, I think the answer is very clear. The very fact that this question had to be asked in the interview was clearly a, uh, a, uh, a signal that at some level this has rankled or this has affected the BJP, um, you know, in, whether it is to a significant extent or a smaller extent, we can debate. But the very fact that the question had to be asked and the Prime Minister at length had to explain or come up with some kind of explanation to justify the whole thing, that itself is your answer. The second point, and this is again uh, the key question which was not asked. The Prime Minister says earlier on it was black money which was coming in, now it is accounted money. Why did the government go to such great lengths to prevent the list of names from being put out in public domain? Why did the SBI then go and say that it would take three months for us to give the data and so on? That was the question which was crying to be asked. Obviously, it was not asked, you know, uh, and I, one does not expect it to be asked either. The point really... No, why does one not expect it to be asked? No, no, one minute. Why should it not be asked? It should have been asked. Well, uh, considering that this is primarily a propaganda interview, I don't expect uh, the question to be asked. I mean, this was basically to set up, uh, you know, to bowl a few full tosses so that the Prime Minister could articulate uh, his position. This was not to bowl him Yorkers. I mean... We've seen ANI before every election do this, uh, Rajdeep. I don't know why uh, there should be any surprise at all on this factor. So, but that's okay. I mean, no, having that's, you that... see, that's the prerogative of the prime minister to decide how he wants to do an interview, who he wants to do it with. Salman Soz, you're smiling. The truth of the matter, and I must make this candid, it's not as if Sonia Gandhi is ready to take any hard questions. I did an interview with her where she, before the interview, said she will not take any political questions. I had done a previous interview where I had asked her about dynasty democracy. She was uncomfortable. So let's, you know, the Congress is trying to suggest so, this so is you, a problem. you tell us why was the question no. not asked? Yeah, then, no, 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 why but, was the question not asked? Sure, it should have been okay. asked. So Salman Soz, the truth of the matter, though, is that whether propaganda interview or not, the Prime Minister is giving his view specifically on electoral bonds, which the sense one gets is not an issue resonating, certainly not in rural uh, Karnataka, where I've just come from. Maybe, maybe Rajdeep, let me just put it this way. First, as far as our leadership is concerned, uh, uh, Sonia ji, uh, obviously she she is not, you know, the president is Kharge ji and Rahul no, no, She has never taken hard leaders. questions in most of her, no, her but, political but, career Rajdeep, over 25 Rajdeep, years. She has also taken hard questions. Rajdeep, so before you accuse I, the I prime minister of propaganda, you've also got to look within. Rajdeep, Rajdeep, uh, Malik Arjun Kharge ji is our president. Rahul ji is our former president and, and obviously the leader of the party. They're constantly doing press conferences, constantly doing press conferences. You know it. Everybody watching the TV show know, shows know. There is no comparison with the orchestrated event management of the prime minister. Be that as it may, Rajdeep, let me, let me dispel this notion that uh, this is not resonating. If this issue was not resonating, Rajdeep, why is it that in a recent survey by the CSDS, 55% of the people in this country are saying that corruption has increased in the last five years? And by the way, isn't it a big thing in your, I mean, you're a political journalist. Is it not a big thing that now this whole facade of na khaunga na khane dunga, basically the people of the country realize that the BJP is, is the biggest, the most corrupt party in the country right now, but now it's all the same from their perspective. So maybe they don't talk about electoral bonds, but by the way, these kinds of things matter to the Indian public. Why? Because when you do uh, danda lo chanda do, what happens is that you, you end up financing the kinds of infrastructure projects that do not create jobs. And which is the number one issue in this country for the people of the country? 
I'm not saying it. A CSDS survey is saying it. It is jobs. The I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. I'll come to that, Mr. Soz. It's interesting that the that the Prime Minister was not asked any questions on how is he going to actually resolve the unemployment crisis, which is really what many believe is the top issue. But how do you respond to Insina when you hear a Suman, uh, Suman Raman say propaganda interview, when you hear... Uh, uh, Salman so suggests event management that the Prime Minister is not addressing the real issues of our time? Well, if Suman C. Raman wants to, you know, apply for a job in ANI and then interview the Prime Minister, he can try his luck. And, you know, when Salman Sos talks about, I don't know why he waxes eloquent about Rahul Gandhi's press conferences, we have seen in the last few months that Rahul Gandhi remains constantly confused about whether petrol and diesel comes under the ambit of GST or not. The sister gets confused over the full form of MSP. And these people, you know, have the audacity to uh, talk about... Uh, Rahul Gandhi's press conferences, goofy press conferences, you know, do they think it's easy to sit for one and a half hours for a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, interview? The only time Rahul Gandhi did that on the eve of 2014 elections, we have seen what happened with Arnab Goswami. So I think, you know, they need to do a reality check. It's not easy to talk seamlessly for one and a half hours. And moreover, let me, you know, bring back the main focus of today's interview. For the first time, you have a prime minister who is single-mindedly only focused over the larger development goals over the, last, over the next two decades. He's not talking freebies. He's talking empowerment. Things like, you know, 70 plus citizens, uh, 70 years plus citizens getting uh, uh, Ayushman Bharat, the, lo the Mudra loan getting extended to, uh, the upper lim limit being extended to 20 lakhs. These are very transformative things which the Congress will never be able to fathom, besides obviously the focus on international affairs, India championing the cause of Global South. What does Congress manifesto read? So I think, you know, there is a world of difference between the thinking, between the thought process of Modi ji and uh, Rahul Gandhi. They may, they may wax eloquent about Rahul Gandhi's goofy press conferences. Good luck to them. Okay, let me, since you spoke about the Prime Minister looking to the future in 2047, which is a running theme now through his interview, that's his real election pitch. Vote for me for a Vixit Bharat in 2047, Amrit Kal. Let's listen into what the Prime Minister said and he compared six decades of Congress rule with his 10 years. How did he uh, respond? Listen in. 2024 is the country. It is the Congress model. और एक बीजेपी सरकार का मोड़ है उनका पांच छह दशक का काम मैं उनके लिए बहुत खुला मैदान छोड़ता हूं पांच छह दशक का काम और मेरा सिर्फ दस साल का काम कंपैरिजन कीजिए किसी भी क्षेत्र में कंपैरिजन कीजिए अगर कुछ कमियां होगी तो भी हमारी एफर्ट्स में कमी नहीं रही होगी दूसरा मुझे दस साल में दो साल तो कोविड के लड़ाई में जाना पड़ा और आफ्टर इफेक्ट भी बहुत था फिर भी आज हम कंपैरेटिवली देश को स्पीड कहो स्केल कहो सर्वांगीण विकास की बात करें तो वो कहें सर्व समावेशक विकास की बात कहें तो वो देखें हर पैरामीटर पे आपको कांग्रेस के मॉडल से एक ऐसा मॉडल नजर आ रहा है कि हाँ इस रास्ते पर हम चलेंगे इतनी गति से और गति और बढ़ानी है मुझे अगले टर्म में गति भी बढ़ानी है और स्केल भी बढ़ाना है यू नो सो हियर इज द प्राइम मिनिस्टर टॉकिंग ऑफ द फ्यूचर राहुल वर्मा ऑफ 2047 दिस इज द सेम प्राइम मिनिस्टर हूं 2017 स्पोक ऑफ न्यू इंडिया इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू वॉट सीम्स टू हैव चेंज इज द कैलेंडर एंड द टाइम लाइन नाउ वी आर नॉट टॉकिंग ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू ओलंपिक गेम्स ट्वेंटी and Amrit Kaal 2047, it's intelligent politics. He says, I'm appealing to the first time voters who will benefit in 2047. Mr. Modi will be 97 by then. Uh, that's right, Rahul. See, there has been a constant theme in Prime Minister Modi's appeal since 2014, which is that what he has been doing is uh, campaigning on politics of hope, politics of future, and politics of a large and grand vision whether it's right or wrong, whether it can be achieved or not, uh, but that is what he has been doing. 
Second, what uh, if you look at 2024 campaign, and if you want to distill uh, entire campaign plank of BJP, it could be reduced to one single line, which is basically talking about national and civilizational resurgence. And so you can link everything from hosting G20 summit or the plan of uh, 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 hosting Olympics or developed India by 2047, Chandrayaan mission to construction of Ram Temple. Uh, all of these things is basically linked to this big positive plan. And this is what a good campaign is about. Both attacking the uh, 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 sort of like opposition, negative campaigning, and then also presenting a positive vision about the country and what they are going to do. And this is what I think the opposition has to learn from Prime Minister Modi and BJP's campaign is the ability to mix both positive and neg negative campaigning at the same time and targeting multiple constituencies. What opposition to my mind fails or, or does is basically talks multiple things, but they're not linked together and they are not targeting multiple constituencies at the, uh, at the same time. You know, that, that's a very important point, Sumant Raman. You see, whether you lie, whether you're a pro-Modi, whether you're a pro-Modi supporter or anti-Modi, Modi exudes hope. In this entire interview, the one four-word uh, letter that, I, that comes to me is hope. Mr. The, that's the one word he wants to, wants to push, hope. I'm offering the hope a dream of 2047. Forget about 2024, look ahead to 2047. Yeah, uh, Radeep, I agree on that point. I mean, he is giving the vision of a brighter future, um, which I think the opposition parties um, have not been very successful either in their manifesto or in the manner of their campaigning to do, because they are focusing essentially on the nitty gritty, but not really giving that bright future. But having said that, all we need to do is to go back and look at the set of promises made in 2014 and 19. Farmers' incomes will be doubled by 2022. Uh, we were told that there will be a bullet train which would be running at some point of time. There would be uh, irrigation provided to all farms. There would be, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, every every uh, by 2022, nobody zero fatalities in the Indian railways. Uh, you know, I, I can go on and on, uh, uh, Rajiv, but. You have to look at it. Those promises, many of those promises have not been met. And now, uh, okay, the big one, 5 trillion economy by 2024. Now, we are, we are almost four months into 2024, and we know that that, again, is not going to be achieved. The point really is that people somehow still tend to want to, uh, I won't use the word fall for, but, you know, want to hope for all these grand visions or grand promises that they would be fulfilled at some point of time, rather than look at the nitty gritty issues and say, what about my unemployment rate now? What about all the uh, local issues, which are really the, uh, what about inflation and so on? So I think that, that to that extent, you've got to hand it to the prime minister. He has succeeded in selling a vision and selling a package. Now, even if that package is not fully delivered, uh, he's now shifted so, the uh, yard. So he's so shifting. Plenty of time. He's selling a dream. You know, Tuin Sinha, the charge sometimes made against Prime Minister is he's India's best event manager come dream merchant. He's selling a dream of the future. But what about the reality today? Should we not look at 2024 in the context of the last 10 years? Goals achieved. Did farmers' income get doubled? Did un uh, 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 Has unemployment been significantly reduced? Are these not questions that the Prime Minister must answer his own track record after 10 years rather than telling me, vote for me because I'll give you a glorious future in 2047? Well, absolutely. And, you know, people don't tend to be as pessimists as the Congress Party. That is why they are, they, they can see the truth. 25 crore people pulled out of uh, poverty, multidimensional poverty, 50 crore jandhan accounts, 13 crore tap water connections. I think these are, these are things which people can, you know, these are visible. These are not promises. These are visible. 70% increase in the stretch of national highways, double the number of airports we had in 2014, 700 kilometers of metro lines. Some of, you know, uh, Sumanthi Raman might be benefiting from that in Chennai. But then these are things which are visible to everybody except the pessimistic opposition of this country. And what is wrong in selling a dream? You know, it's not a dream, it's a vision. 
it it spurs ambition for a nation which could never think beyond the beyond the immediate five years for the first time we have a plan for the next 20 years and these are aggressive plans so mind you for the first time the whole you know perspective the whole way we are looking at a manifesto has changed this mm -hmm. manifesto is a mere catalyst in the larger 20 year vision which the bjp has provided and look at the emphasis we have put on manufacturing that too specifically you know the the high value product manufacturing defense products and railway manufacturing compare it with the with the, the congress manifesto where the clear insinuation is they would be focusing on you know sweatshops Can rather I? than semiconductor industries so i think you know this is a vision for, we have provided a so vision for the future and the contrast you are saying you are providing so a vision for the next 20 years a road map you know salman shows when i see the prime minister he exudes a sense of hope and optimism, like him or not. That's how he is. When you look at Rahul Gandhi on the other, he seems constantly angry and thereby seems to exude, according to his critics, a sense of negativism. Everything is wrong in India. Nothing is going right. Now, maybe New India wants positivity, not negativity. That's the difference. Rajdeep, you should be angry. We should all be angry. The people of this country should be angry. Because, Rajdeep, because that's the reality. We live in the real world. This make-believe world of the Prime Minister is not going to work. This Prime Minister talked about Jab Mesat Mayne Me Karunga Jo Saar Saal Me Niwa, 60 years. And what did he do? He did that. Unemployment rate, rate 50 year high. Household savings dropped to a 50 year low. Manufacturing, our friend talked about manufacturing. It's 13% of the economy. It's the lowest since 1967, Rajdeep. Credit growth in 2017 was at a 55-year low. The prime minister said that he was going to increase the double the farmers' incomes. They actually decreased. They declined. They did not double. They declined in real terms. That is what the prime minister and the BJP have done to this country. And you're saying we should not be angry? We should all be angry, and people are angry. But this they is are you see, that, you see way, it's too. Just, they, they are saying they are offering wait, a vision. Wait, wait, wait. You see, they are right, offering a vision for the future, vision, which is rose tinted. You are no, saying no, no, everything no. is terrible. Nothing is going I'm right in India. That. I'm not saying that. India has great potential, but you need to have the right policies. Now, our friend from the BJP said that the Congress manifesto is about creating sweatshops because we, Mirazi, believe in micro and small and medium enterprises because that is what creates jobs around the world, not just India. That's the model. These guys want to create these high capital intense kind of intensive, uh, uh, you know, uh, companies. What they do is they they have high value added maybe, but they don't create jobs. And what is the number one issue in this country? Jobs. And what is the number two issue? The number two issue is inflation. And why do we have so much inflation? Because there's a supply side constraint. Demonetization destroyed MSMEs in this country, destroyed them. GST came in, clobbered the, uh, the, the small industries in this country. How can you create jobs without that? That is why they've modeled the Twins, Sina, 78 they are, minute, 78 minute, in, this country. 78 minute issue and the Prime Minister stays away from the critical issues of how are you going to resolve the job crisis. As I said, there are no easy solutions, no quick fixes. But he, he himself is only spinning, you're calling it a vision, some others would call it a dream. But what is the reality on the ground? Let's not get away from the fact that there is a serious problem of jobless growth. You know, Rajdeep, if you go by EPFO data, 1.4 crore jobs per one have been created in the last five years in each of the years. 11 lakh crore of capital expenditure cannot be, simply cannot be jobless growth. But yes, the nature of jobs has changed. Gig economy is picking up in a, in a big way. Therefore, many of these jobs don't instantly register on the system. Fact is that, you know, let me remind you, let me just remind you why, why people prefer Modi over, over Rahul Gandhi. On the day, India was scripting the historic India Middle East European corridor. Do you remember what Rahul Gandhi was doing? He was singing praises of BRI abroad. So that is the reality why despite despite some glitches and you know in a country as vast as India, there will always be some glitches, immediate glitches. People have implicit, people have explicit trust in Modi ji's vision because Modi ji is thinking grand. 
you know, when, when the India-Middle East-European corridor comes up, we will not only provide, we, will actu we are actually thinking completely global. We will be job providers for other countries. No, but sir, the fact is... Should he tell people, me what he's done in the last 10 years? So should a prime minister a seeking a third term tell me what he's, doing in the la what he's done in the last 10 years? Or tell me now what he will do in 2047? Should 2024 be a report card on 10 years? No, or what exactly happens what in 2047? Absolutely, when it comes to infrastructure, when it, when it comes to poverty elevation, when it comes to 35 lakhs crore mm -hmm. of money being directly put into the hands of poor through DBT schemes, through 3 lakh plus schemes and through DBT, you know, this was the same money which at one point of time Rajiv Gandhi would just plead helpless and uh, say that, you know, when, when, when I spend okay. one, one rupee, only 15 paise goes away. 35 lakh crore putting being put directly into the hands of the poor through DBT, that is revolutionary. Is India DPI, India's DPI is sooner than later going to be replicated in at least 50 countries across uh, across the globe, okay. providing so India no, rare no one, financial I leadership. Think, okay, there are, there are achievements. Digital infrastructure is among them. Infrastructure in general. And there are holes as well. The Prime Minister seems to project the glasses half full. His critics projected as more than half empty. But, uh, Rahul Varma, either way, people seem to trust the Prime Minister. There's a word which comes in. It's, uh, over the last 10 years, he seems to have built an air of trust. Unless you're a real fierce critic of Modi, You'll acknowledge that. Where does this trust factor come from? Uh, multiple things. Uh, I, I, I don't think anyone can deny on Prime Minister's popularity, not just uh, the surveys in India, but even by global standards. After 10 years uh, being in power, uh, no leader uh, has this kind of approval rating. In the recent CSDS poll, Prime Minister uh, is, is around 48% popularity rating, which is very, very high. Uh, why is there so much trust in Prime Minister Modi? I think it has to do with, one, uh, uh, his own sort of like charisma appeal and other kind of things. Uh, two, this gets amplified in absence of a, a weaker national level leadership uh, mm -hmm. in the opposition ranks. Uh, three, I think his popularity and trust is also built on some abstract ideas, not actually on concrete deliverables. So, you know, in, in a survey, I think long back five years ago, uh, while I had analyzed the data, uh, uh, if you ask, uh, uh, like, Prime Minister, like, uh, how trustworthy Prime Minister is on questions of economy, basically delivering, say, jobs, mm -hmm. uh, delivering on, on, on economic growth, the trust levels were lower. But if you ask questions such as, India's image has improved uh, uh, in, in uh, global standard. Trust levels for the prime minister was higher. And this is again tied to this uh, basically big grand vision, which is creating uh, a, a sort of like a politics of hope and politics of future. So right. trust in Modi is not actually on concrete day-to-day, -day, everyday issues, but on grand vision uh, is what I think is happening. Okay, let me turn to another interesting element of that interview where the Prime Minister spoke on Sanatan Dharma, uh, virtually attacking the Congress party, claiming it had joined the anti-Sanatan DMK. Of course, forgetting the fact that Atal Bihari Vajpayee had the DMK as his prime ally. But that's the Prime Minister at times. Listen in to what he had to say on Sanatan and Mandir. जो कांग्रेस जिसके था किसी जमाने में महात्मा गांधी का नाम जुड़ा हुआ था जो कांग्रेस जहां इंदिरा गांधी जी गले में माला खुलेआम पहन करके घूमती थी रुद्राक्ष माला जो हां रुद्राक्ष माला पहन करके घूमती थी इंदिरा जी सवाल कांग्रेस को पूछना चाहिए कि तुम्हारी क्या मजबूरी है कि सनातन के खिलाफ इतना जहर उगलने वाले लोगों के साथ तुम क्यों बैठे हो भाई क्या तुम्हारी राजनीति अधूरी रह जाएगी क्या ये कौन सी कांग्रेस की सोच विकृति आ रही है कांग्रेस में ये चिंता का विषय है डीएमके का तो जन्म शायद इस नफरत में पैदा हुआ होगा और धीरे धीरे वो नफरत का खेल भी उनका लोग स्वीकार करने नहीं लगे हैं और इसलिए वो नए नए तौर तरीके अपना करके बोल रहे प्रश्न उनका नहीं है प्रश्न कांग्रेस जैसी पार्टी का है कि उसने अपना मूल कैरेक्टर गवा दिया है क्या जब संविधान सभा में जो लोग बैठे थे 
तो ज्यादातर गांधीन लोग थे ज्यादातर कांग्रेस की विचारधारा से जुड़े हुए लोग थे और पहला संविधान बना उसके हर पेज पर जो पेंटिंग है वो सनातन की ही परंपरा से जुड़े हुए हैं तो आपका संविधान बना उस संविधान में सनातन का गौरव का हिस्सा था और आज सनातन को इतनी भयंकर गालियां देने की हिम्मत हो और आप उनके साथ चुनाव की राजनीति करें उनके साथ मंच साझा करें मजबूरी कांग्रेस की ये देश के लिए चिंता का विषय है Suman Raman this has been a running theme of the prime minister especially when he's gone to Tamil Nadu eighth visit today that the congress has aligned with the anti sanatan dmk do you believe this will resonate in this election as some polls seem to suggest it will not resonate radeep in southern india there will be no resonance the prime minister knows it very well this dialogue is essentially to uh, you know maybe stir the emotion pot in northern in the hindi belt state we saw how effectively the prime minister used this in madhya pradesh rajasthan uh, chatisgarh at the time of elections in so many rally after rally he kept speaking about this issue and perhaps it 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 did pay dividends as at least uh, to some extent from the results so i think that this is not um, you know primarily targeted at southern india because this will have very little resonance here but in the northern states yes it is likely to have a, uh, an impact mind you the dmk as you yourself pointed out has been saying pretty much the same thing for the last 60 years and uh, at that point of time mr vajpayee's government had no problem in including the dmk and having them as members of their own uh, government so i think that to that extent um, this too will not find a very significant resonance right but it's again the old card um, radeep the old card of trying to say that congress is anti hindu you know they are not uh, uh, you know they want they but- are But it is a card that maybe, but it is a card that we've seen in recent times that seems to have some resonance. Salman says, like it or not, Sonia Gandhi at an India Today summit a few months, a few years ago, admitted that the Congress had been was now being seen as a pro-Muslim and dare one say anti-Hindu party, and that had in a way boxed the Congress. And the Prime Minister is trying to box you in again. Yeah, Saying, why did you attend the, the Pran Pratishta of the Ram Mandir, Rajdeep? The Prime Minister, the the Prime Minister plays his usual divisive politics when elections come close. This is not new. However, what is new, Rajdeep, is people are not taking the bait. They are not. Even this recent survey, you know, whether it's accurate or not, the recent survey from CSDS says that only two percent of the respondents in that survey. were voting for hindutva only 2% by the way 80% close to 80% of this country believes that all indians including muslims with that which i am too have equal rights in this country are equal indians that is 80% of this country despite all this project of the rss and the bjp mm-hmm. people have seen through it okay. you know why rajdeep you know why the reason is that when unemployment bites it bites hindus and muslims and sikhs everybody when inflation bites it bites hindus and muslims and sikhs everybody so the prime minister may want to basically for his vote bank politics try to alienate southern india and try to do something that to try to consolidate his vote in northern india but the fact of the matter is that people have seen through this rajdeep okay. and i can tell you rajdeep today on your show let me tell you in karnataka in maharashtra in rajasthan in bihar in uttar pradesh in haryana they are losing seats rajdeep they are losing seats okay and even in gujarat they are we'll, losing seats rajdeep okay even in gujarat I, okay i want to still focus on the pm's interview and as a final word to insira what's actually important for me in this interview what the prime minister didn't say as i said he didn't say what sumant raman just now said that dmk was a firm ally of mr vajpay uh till uh, when the uh, nda was in power what the prime minister didn't say no, no, is that when just a minute when someone shifts sides and joins his government suddenly the ed doesn't go after them what the prime minister didn't say is that when he joins hands with deva gowda and hd kumaraswamy no one talks then of dynasty is the prime minister being selective is my final question yes he's positioning himself as this visionary but there's also the other side when will that other side also be recognized or will it all be about modi right, ki guarantee about one individual Asso- is it about the party or is it about an individual are you fighting this election on simply brand modi well yes and why not see 
you know, when it comes to DMK, you give me one instance during the Vajpayee era when they had the audacity to unleash this anti-Sanatan tirade. Fact is that when they are with us, they have to behave themselves, but they get emboldened when they are with the Congress party. And I will give you a very sim simple example. You know, DMK as a party has been prone to such bouts of anti-Sanatan, you know, behavior from, from the last 50, 60 years. In 1956, when Periyar had unleashed a similar anti-Sanatan tirade, Nehru wrote a scathing letter to Kamraj saying he's a lunatic and should be put in an asylum. Compare it with 2023. When the Sanatan, when they called, when DMK called Sanatan Dharm, Dengue, Malaria and what not and called for its eradication, how did Rahul Gandhi respond? He did not utter a word, but the Congress party went out of its way to glorify Periyar on social media and wish him on his birthday and what not. So this is the difference between this Congress, which is meek, which is which has completely succumbed, which is at the mercy of IU women in Kerala. Mm -hmm. Do you realize, can you, can you show it on your channel that throughout this campaign, Rahul Gandhi is not even able to use his party's flag because the IUML is not allowing him. You know, okay. one year ago, Rahul Gandhi went to the US where he gave certificates to IUML calling them perfectly secular. A few weeks later, IUML went, took out a procession in Kerala asking for the slaughter of Hindus. He did not have the courage to utter a word because he is at the mercy of IUML. And this Congress party is the modern day Muslim League. That's a fact. Okay. I'm going to leave, the, leave it there. You're again bringing in the Muslim League uh, equivalence uh, of, of a pre-partition Muslim League. Uh, Obviously, it is election time. But I gave you examples, Rajdeep. Yeah, but uh, okay. I gave yeah. you specific your, your examples. Claim, uh, those are your claims. Are you the, the flip side would be that you're using the Muslim League as a bogey to try and target an entire party. Are you ML flag issue? Okay. Fact check. Yes. Uh, what's the quick fact check, Suman? Very quickly. Yeah, the quick fact check is in 2019, at the time of Rahul Gandhi filing his nomination, they called the IUML flag as the Pakistani flag and said Pakistan flags were waved at the, uh, uh, you know, at the uh, time Rahul Gandhi filed his nomination. So this time they wanted to avoid a repeat of that and being called as why, why do they love Pakistan so much and all yeah, that dialogue. There will be so that was raised, the reason those flags no, no, were I'll not take there. your point, but why there will be Congress questions raised that out of all the constituencies flag. in the country, Rahul Gandhi has chosen a constituency where the Muslim question League is, is his ally. Party not using There's a, Rahul Gandhi, but that is another debate. Which also needs to be handled whether the Congress party, by making all these decisions, why not and not Amethi, do they create situations which the BJP as an opposition is going to exploit? This is politics. We are not living in some sadhu sant ashram where political parties will not use every opportunity to nail and box their opponents. And the Prime Minister, I can tell you, knows how to punch. That certainly is something he's learned over 50 years in public life. Let me leave it there. We've heard the interview of the Prime Minister. Maybe many questions are missing and hopefully at some stage he will answer all those questions and more. Uh, but for now, he's as always set the narrative in a way.